Sir Stephen Tyndall is one of the country's most famous businessmen, founder and driving force behind those ubiquitous red sheds, the warehouse chain. He built the business from one store in Auckland to the retail force it is now, with an annual turnover in excess of $1.5 billion. Sir Stephen is a business leader worth listening to. Here he shares his insights into leadership and culture and starts by describing his leadership style. So Stephen, how would you describe your leadership style? I think my leadership style is what's commonly called servant leadership, which is if you can picture uh, the, a, a triangle uh, and at the bottom, which would normally be called the apex, uh, you, you have the leader. And then the people that you interface with very, very carefully at sort of senior management level uh, are the people that you're there to support. Uh, their job is to support the next layer up, and so that when you're looking at an organisation with a large number of both people and stakeholders, the vast majority of those, of course, are in the thick end of the, of the triangle. So I see servant leadership as giving the, the support, first of all, to the immediate people that would report to you, um, who in turn do the same up the triangle, and therefore you have this very inclusive style. Uh, and I think the other thing that I, that I learnt very early in the piece was the way to really get people's confidence was to show an, an incredible interest in them. And so um, having them respect you very much for the fact that they know you respect them enables you to get probably 100% more out of them in terms of performance than you would if they didn't respect you. Do you think other New Zealand business leaders would echo those sentiments of supporting their organisation? I think if they thought of it in those terms, they would, yes. What motivated you to success in business? Um, I, when, I, when I first started the warehouse in particular, if we talk about that part of my life, um, was really motivated by being able to make a real difference to our customers' lives. In other, in other words, their standard of living. I mean, once we got through the first stage of survival, which always happens with a startup, and it became reasonably obvious that we could, in fact, be quite a big player in the New Zealand context, then the purpose of the warehouse was very clear, and that was to make the desirable affordable. In other words, to give everyone a bargain and, at the same time, enable them to actually take advantage of the things they needed at lower prices. And so we didn't just go to the point where we wanted to be just a little less expensive than our competition. We actually went out and used the efficiencies of supply chain management and the efficiencies of business to get our costs to a point where we could in fact drive prices way lower. So if you look across a number of metrics, even today in the general merchandise sector in New Zealand, we're you know, up to 20% less expensive uh, than our competition. So it was this real purpose to make a huge difference to people's lives. As a price setter in the retail market, do you think you've driven competitors' prices down? Absolutely. I mean, what, what happens in a big marketplace, and if you think of the era in which we were actually growing at quite a lot of speed, we were still a very small organisation in relation to the big competition of the days. I mean, Kmart of Australia were a much bigger player than us in the early days. Um, farmers Trading Company, who also had this group called Decker. Uh, that, that, you know, they were the big boys in the industry, and we also competed to some degree with the grocers in their non-food products. Uh, and so what we did by driving down prices was we created a much more competitive marketplace. Some of the things that Walmart did we modelled ourselves off. I mean, Walmart is an incredibly efficient organisation, particularly when you look at the way they run their supply chain. Um, and we definitely modelled ourselves on that. We, we, we put a huge amount of investment and in thinking into the way we take a product from a manufacturer's basically production line right through to the shelf where we sell it to the general public. So that we modelled ourselves off them there. But there is a number of other things that I would say we didn't model ourselves uh, on Walmart. We, you know, we've observed the way that they have been so successful. But there are some things that we think... Um, the Kiwi way of doing it is much different from the American way of doing it, and so we've been much more Kiwi in our way. Can you give me an example? Well, I think, I think one of the things that Walmart, for example, <clears throat> gets criticised for is um, you know, a very low-wage 
uh, mentality. Whereas I think we do try as best we can uh, to actually be the, the higher paying uh, organisation in our, in our marketplace. So we've always looked at how can we actually share our profits with our people. So in the early days, most of our employees were on a, on a, a sort of a yeah, profit share basis. Uh, and we've continued to try and keep that going. It's called a personal incentive program. Uh, and, and we've also benchmarked ourselves against the industry and tried to be at the upper end of that. So that's one example. How did you foster a culture in the warehouse and how important is a specified culture to an organisation? My, my personal belief is a culture is absolutely paramount. <clears throat> the, the difference between a business with a really strong culture and one without is that you've got a 100 year company as opposed to one that you know, might not be around even five years out. So the culture is hugely important, I mean a positive one. Ours I think developed from our very early sort of ethos which was where people come first and quality is affordable. So we always tried to say how do we make people in the organisation sort of the major focus and we said there are a large number of stakeholders in any organisation, particularly retail. You know, it comes from the customer first, but then you've got suppliers, you've got to have a really close relationship with them. You've got to have a very close relationship with the community and, and therefore we, we got closely into sort of raising funds for community projects early on and having a number of things where we interfaced with the community, red shirts and schools, etc. And then of course, um, there's your, your staff or the people within the organisation, a very, very important stakeholder. And then lastly, there's the shareholders. So to try and get a balance across that, it's a very much people oriented um, approach. And if you get people who are highly motivated because they believe in the purpose, which I've already talked about, which is you know, to make people's lives, your customers' lives, a lot easier by having much cheaper prices, um, then people feel good about what they do. They come to work, you know, they get out of bed every morning thinking, I'm actually making a difference. It's not just a job. I don't come along just to earn my wages. I come along to actually provide an answer to the purpose. Uh, and I think as a result of that, we've, we've had very, very motivated staff through the 26 years of the company. And that's made, you know, a massive difference. Is it good to fail? Absolutely. Why? Because you learn. Um, and today in what I do, uh, which is, a, is basically helping fund a lot of startup companies, so I've used the dividends from the warehouse since I moved out of, of the CEO role to enable me to get involved in helping get a lot of New Zealand startup companies going. And what happens in small startup companies is you do have a number of failures, but you do learn from your failures as to you know, why you made that mistake and why you shouldn't repeat it. And in fact, in, in the US, which you've got to say is probably the, the most successful company for growing businesses over the last century, um, they've had this sort of badge of honour that, that runs around uh, failure. And if we take you know, some of New Zealand's greatest leaders, um, and I think of Peter Blake, who had, I think, four failures in his Round the World campaign with the Whitbread before he won. I think that's the true, I think, mark of of a leader, somebody who can get up, pick themselves up and go and go at it again. Uh, I had a failure with my very first business when I was about 19. I went uh, into business with another guy in a coffee bar as a part-time thing while I was studying and uh, that business failed. Um, but it also, it made me realise, you know, that um, there were things that we did then uh, which I've never repeated since. So, um, you know, I think failure is important. Why did you start this coffee bar, and where was it? Uh, it was just about um, a mile from here, the Haraki Corner. Yep. And uh, I, in those days, used to do a bit of musical comedy, and I met a guy who was quite a few years older than I was. I think we were doing the um, Sound of Music, and he and his wife were at a loose end and were looking for something to do, and uh, they said they had some capital and uh, they wanted a bit more and they wanted a business partner so I got involved and we, um, we bought um, building materials and fitted out a new um, business and um, what we did was we, we didn't realise at the time that we'd undercapitalised ourselves the actual cost of fitting this uh, coffee bar out was um, 
a lot more than we'd anticipated. Um, the budget on the sales wasn't as, as uh, wasn't accurate, and so we weren't selling enough. And we found quite quickly that um, because the other party was not able to actually come up with the capital they said they had, we were in trouble quite quickly. Uh, where I was lucky was I managed to um, find somebody to buy the business office, and we were able to pay all the creditors and get out of jail. But you know you could say it was a failure. As an angel investor. How many companies have you backed? Well, I think the, the general rule is percentages, and I think probably the percentage that, that you could say has failed is about, so far, 6 or 7%. But generally in the start, in, in venture capital, which is really what I'm doing, you, yep. get, you get one or two that are superstars, you get about four or five that are okay, that do quite well, but not sensational, and then you get some that, the, the rest of them are failures, which you basically lose money on. You've just got to make sure that the good ones make up for the bad ones. In contrast with the US, do you think New Zealand has a culture that is accepting of failure? It doesn't appear to be that the case, uh, in, in my opinion. I think that there is a culture that, that would say, gosh, if that person failed, we have to be really careful about uh, extending credit or, um, or backing that person with capital again. Um, so I don't think we're that, accept we're that accepted. A bore, um, accepting, I should say, in that area. So that's one aspect in terms of bank funding. Do you think it's more ingrained in the Kiwi psyche? Take the All Blacks. They have one test, they win. The next, they lose. It's all doom and gloom. Yeah, I do. I think, I think we, we, t we do tend to get uh, pretty dark on failure pretty quickly. So we have our ups and downs and if we think of the last couple of weeks, you know, we, we get from the highs of of beating the South Africans to the lows of losing to them, and then, and then you know, with the Australians, we uh, we we lost and felt terrible, and now we're euph euphoric again. Um, it's part of our our culture and our nature, I think. Do we need to change that? I think we do. I, I think it would be um, a lot easier on everybody if we accepted failure occasionally and. and basically accepted that you can't win everything and can't win all the time, but let's learn from that in the same way as the All Blacks just did last Saturday and turn uh, what was a failure into a great success. If there was one thing you wish you knew at the start of your business career that you've had to learn but would pass on as a tip, what would that be? I think it's um, don't jump into some, don't jump into things too quickly without researching them properly and road testing them sometimes you can go ahead with you know a venture uh, too quickly and so I think that's the number one for me you know there, there is a lot of pre preparation you can actually do and there's a lot of testing you can do which is low cost before you push the button on on taking a big risk is there a book that has been an influential read for you, and would you recommend it to others? If you don't mind, I'll, I'll give you two. Yeah. Uh, the first one that was a, a book I read just after I left school uh, by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, it was a top seller in those days, and what it taught me was if you show a massive amount of genuine, inf uh, genuine interest in other people, uh, then they will actually like you and they'll, they'll be prepared to follow you in terms of you know, a business leadership model. And the second one is Jim Collins' book, uh, which is about five years old, called, well in fact he's written two, Built to Last, uh, but the, the best one is Good to Great. And that book I think is a highly influ influential book because it has so much underlying research behind it and it's, a, it able, it's able to tell you um, because of the research, how business leaders succeed. And it's more about the hare and the tortoise type approach, which is uh, the hare ne never usually succeeds, but the tortoise who just keeps going in a resolute, strong and steady way are usually the, the best business leaders. He, he described it, doesn't he, as, I think, as a hedgehog yeah. um, view. Yeah, the hedgehog approach. And, and then the other big part of that book is, is making sure that you have the right people on the bus, as he calls it, and that the wrong people jump off.